Hey guys, welcome back. We're here. We have a little bit of a, a Yu-Gi-Oh dilemma, a little bit of a concern. We have TCA Gaming who recently posted this Blue Eyes White Dragon without a name on it, with Magic and Wizards on the back, uh, supposedly a test print. I've received many messages from concerned individuals that this might be uh, maybe not as legitimate as it seems. There's a, there's a lot of questions to be asked. And uh, that's why I brought in Gezi TCG here, uh, who is a little bit more of a, a lot more of a Yu-Gi-Oh expert than I am. Uh, a so little's fine. Would like to have a little bit <laughs> of a discussion uh, with him about this. See where the flaws are. I know some big red flags of mine. Uh, there is an individual uh, who apparently had similar cards uh, by the name of Shunzuke, who was a two-time world champion. Yu-Gi-Oh! World Champion, uh, who apparently turned to uh, the the dark side of counterfeiting, um, selling and or producing uh, after being banned for cheating, allegedly. I don't know the whole story on that exactly. I don't know if anyone knows the whole story on that, uh, but definitely sure, something sure. to be looking into. It's definitely a name that comes up with stuff like this. Uh, apparently was selling believable fake G3 uh, Dark Magician Girls. Uh, who that were also missing the name. I have a photo of that somewhere. It's in my my slides here. Uh, I'll yep. get you to check out my share screen if you aren't already. Uh, also had the Magic and Wizards on the back. Some fake DM1 cards, uh, and was the first person apparently known to have those or be in possession of those. So we have um, a little bit of a, I guess, a conflict of interest here uh, with the the research seemingly being done by Omega Collectibles LLC. Um, who has copies of the Blue Eyes White Dragon uh, and a Dark Magician Girl that uh, we also have photos that we'll take a look at here, uh, which is, you know, I, I mean, somebody has to do the research, but still at the same time, uh, we do have to take into consideration that there, there is a little bit of uh, financial interest involved there uh, with them being real. Also, no one's perfect, uh, and I think uh, at one point had previously purchased uh, fake... Uh, Takahashi autos um, at one point in time. So, like, anyone can mess up. Authentication is a hard thing. I need to see a lot of receipts on something like this, whether it's Pokemon, whether it's Yu-Gi-Oh! or anything like that. Like, it, whether it's proto stories, whatever it is, the information needs to be there before you start just slapping this thing in a piece of plastic, calling it real. Now, uh, we have several sellers. It seems like one initial seller previous seller and new seller um, that had sold something fake. There's a little bit of a link there. Seller moving platforms kind of thing. A um, little bit of shadiness going on there. I mean, a lot of these platforms, you have to be very careful uh, with, if you're buying through Baiyi, if you're buying through any middleman service. All of these, like yep. Yahoo Japan, your Mercari's, all of this stuff, you got to be very careful. Anyone can list anything, essentially, and they can scam you. And then middleman companies can't do a whole lot about it. It's kind of like an online garage sale. If they get ripped off, you get ripped off. Uh, and there's kind of no turning back from that, whether it's resealed product, counterfeits, whatever it might be. So be careful on all of those. Uh, what else we got? We got the uh, no name blue eyes, white dragon seller. Um, that yeah, had posted about the, apparently uh, an hourglass wizard card uh, that was counterfeit, but I think that was confirmed very counterfeit. If I'm not mistaken. Uh, that uh, that it was kind of just not, like not sure. printed onto a cardstock or something like that. Again, something that uh, definitely needs some more looking into. Uh, and then I guess most importantly is the fact that uh, the source for all these cards won't comment on authenticity or where it came from. And it says that kind of right in the listing itself. So now before I turn it over to you, I will ask you guys to go check out Gezi TCG on Instagram. Give them a follow if you're into Yu-Gi-Oh! If you're not into Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, if you'd like to learn anything, I think this is all important information, whether you collect Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, any trading cards whatsoever. Uh, it's all, all good stuff to learn. All right. I'll let you, let you get into your, to your stuff. Yeah. So, um, um, so I, I, I don't want to talk too much about this, but. Um, and I'll, I'll try and stay concise and I'll, I'll I'm going to really try and stick to the facts here as much as possible. Yeah. Cause I, I don't want to speak out of turn because, you know, I, I don't have all the answers when it comes to stuff like this. 
Um, what I what I can say is that like I don't have a problem with the work that Drew and Omega did. In fact, like I respect the work that they did. They they did some hard work and procured copies and examples, right? Like they sunk some money into this. There there were some sunk costs. You know, they did good research. They looked at the licensing, right? They're they're looking at print qualities. They're comparing qualities to other cards that we can, right? Uh, assess that are, are that are authentic, like volume one and, and and things like that, right? So that that's what they're supposed to do. We expect people doing research on authenticity to use standards like that. Um, and I don't think that the, the questions ask any or lack any merit that that they're asking. And I um, I think the the topic is exciting, right? There's there's a lot of uh, hype, hype that goes around anything. Anytime you talk about like this is the first type this is a prototype this is you know a first release and consequently there's a lot of risk because there's a lot of value right that's what we're trying to generate here um and so i think that ultimately their research just lacks foundation right that they the claims that they're making aren't necessarily as well founded as they want them to be and it, and it, it might be uh, part of it might be that they they just simply aren't looking at some things, or they may be biased, and I and it may be a little bit of both. And I, I don't want to be unfair to them because again, like they did a lot of good work on this, but you know I'm just not seeing the evidence that I need to 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 go to like a professional company like PSA, like I might, and say you know authenticate these don't or don't authenticate these. Like why would I or would I not? to a company like that and make a recommendation like that. And so those are the questions that I ask. What is my burden of proof if I have to make a professional recommendation and stand up as a steward of my profession, right? I have to make sure that I'm fair and that I'm, I'm using all the right things to actually make a legitimate statement about authenticity and not one that's only somewhat based on or that one that might lack enough foundation to be considered credible. Mm -hmm. So... That that's the, my intro. That's the that, that's the thing too. Is just like you, it, man. Like you put that thing in a piece of plastic, and, you, and people assume that it's authentic, and then they start to run deal. with a story on it. It's it's a very big deal, and not just matters, the materials, right? like making sure the materials are legitimate, but whether or not that thing was cut off a sheet, whether it was hand cut, whether it was, you know, like where did There's it come from? How many are there? Is yeah, there is an authentic man, mm -hmm. right? Like, how do we determine what is or isn't authentic? And when I look at authenticity, I look at two factors. It's production and distribution, right? right? So they must be authentically produced and authentically distributed. So, and there's a difference between something, you know, existing in the wild and something that was legitimately distributed through, um, you know, like a sealed product or a promotional event, mm -hmm. or if it was handed out raw or how was a product distributed? That's mm -hmm. the question that, we should be asking when we when we talk about things like this, right? So the question of production is one of were these actually produced? Like, you know, can we say that these were legitimately produced by Konami? And I think the answer is yes. I don't think that we've ever denied that real Magic and Wizard prototypes or test prints or production runs or whatever you want to call whatever was produced. Right. I don't think that we've ever questioned that they exist in some form or at least did exist. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. They would have gone through licensing and and design and they've got like the magazines that they looked in, you know, and they translated all the works and all of that's real. That's real research that they did. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's all tangible stuff that suggests that these would have or probably were actually made. Right. Like and there's images and, and all that, that that I really do appreciate them bringing to the forefront. The old magazines and stuff like that have all that stuff in it. But the question of distribution is a really big problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not because I want to pick something and pull a string so that they can't prove or they can't sell this or I'm, you know, a tyrant and I want to control this or whatever. It's just because I can't benchmark based off of something that wasn't legitimately distributed. I don't I think know that's fair. how to get an authentic copy of it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, using my best judgment and talking to people who I trust who don't have a financial stake in, in the conversation necessarily, right? Real collectors who mm -hmm. have known about Magic and Wizards cards for decades at least, right? 
since 2013 and before. I mean, these aren't novel. They weren't a secret and we knew about them. It's not like they're bringing this to the forefront and everybody's surprised that they exist. You know, we've known that they exist. And and the reason that they're not at the forefront in magazines and, right, this was the first cards that were ever made is because they're naturally problematic. And we've known that for a long time. Yeah. Um, And so I think that, you know, the distribution is not just a gatekeeping method. It's not so I can be a bureaucrat up at PSA or whatever. It's so that I can benchmark, right? How do I obtain an authentic card, like, with certainty? Well, I can do that for volume one. All I have to do is open a pack. I can do it for WCPS prizes. All I have to do is buy buy a brick, right? Like those are all real ways to obtain authentic copies. Mm-hmm. Even DMG G three eleven Dark Magician Girls ninety thousand dollar promos came in sealed cellos. We know this, so you know we use that as a benchmark. You know I can analyze the volume one dot matrix, the print quality, the surface detail, the back, the alignment, right? Typical problems and things like that. All of that adds multiple layers of security to the authentication process, right? And if you spend 10, 20, even $5,000, wouldn't you want to know with certainty the card you bought was real? Yeah, 100%. That's the thing too. But also, I I feel like I it's really understated with a lot of this stuff, like how important the actual story is. Uh, and whether or not you are getting the story from a you know reliable source and a source that is not just telling a story because they want to make more money off of something. So like the proto stories in Pokemon just blew up. The thing blew up. So Shell yeah. Biaz, who who owned copies of it, didn't disclose that he owned copies of it. First, didn't know the story behind it. Then all of a sudden. CGC, like CGC authenticated it and they kind of ran with it and then you have an auction house that runs with it even more and they, they know everything all at that point. Shell, the guy that had them, the guy that was there, that was able to put his name on magic cards as the illustrator, uh, like basically that much control over something, um, didn't know the story, but then he did know the story. It's, it's just weird that, uh, and I get that you can't always find that years later. You can't get that perfect story and find out what happened, where did it come from, how many exist, who owns them, we that sort of thing. That but kind of a community. But like, yeah, that too. So like I with this, not knowing any of that stuff, and I don't know, maybe the CGC article that's coming out, maybe they have more information on that. I'm like, waiting for the CGC article. When the seller, I'm going to read it with great interest. Yeah, Let's when the seller with the rough translation of, since we can judge from photo, we will never answer questions about authenticity or how to obtain it or how it was obtained, essentially. So, like, Look, that to me, like, a, that is sketchy to begin with. But, like, yes. unless maybe, maybe there's information that we don't know that's going to make these very legitimate. But for me, that's, like, that's, like, red flag number one. And that's just, like, an auction that I would never touch. Forces and provenance are a big deal, right? right. Um, especially when it comes for, to cards like, like this. Things that we can't open a pack to have a discussion about authenticity about. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what we want to find. We want to find some provenance or sources on this stuff. And, and hitting a dead end isn't, isn't really a solution. And saying, oh, well, it is what it is. We'll never know. So it must be real, right? Like, that's not how real authentic authentication works mm-hmm. right like oh the babe ruth baseball you know like oh yeah we don't know where it came from but it's real right like that's not how it works right, right? so you that's can't get halfway there and then just like put it in a slab and you're like well we're done no. for the day call it quits right? guys like, let's go let's go have and, a drink and that's some. a high bar to set right yeah. i acknowledge that this is a high mm-hmm. bar to ask for right to say okay well i'm waiting for someone to come forward and say i'm an original owner i have a story or something like that i'm not waiting for something quite that fantastic man mm-hmm. <laughs> literally like that would be phenomenal but i just don't think it's going to happen right there are other ways to do this but you know not knowing where they procured their copies from or where these copies come from or whatever, right? Given their problematic yeah. nature is a, is a big problem and, and value, right? Like if these were $5 cards, like I wouldn't be having this discussion with you on mm-hmm. YouTube, right? Like, right. but now this is going to go to heritage and this is going to go here. And, yeah. and, these and then people, more people are going to be buying raw dollars, copies. And then if $10,000, mm-hmm. right? Like that's a big deal right like we Uh, we experts want to know like where are these coming from are they real how do we know if they're real like 
what what are the metrics of success here? Like, are we benchmarking this? Do we have provenance? Like, what does the dot matrix look like? Like, I, I'm expected to know this stuff. You mm-hmm. know, PSA gets on the phone, they call me, say, hey, man, like, what's going on with this? Is this stuff real? Like, if we get it, like, what do we do? You know, I got to know about this. I'm expected yeah. to have some kind of professional opinion on it. You know? Yeah. So that's understandable. Yeah. Sources in Providence are a big problem here. You know, I, I don't know how we're going to get it or if it's even possible, but the lack of it in this case with Rusty's copy, with all of these copies, right? Like I asked, where, where did you get them from? Well, uh, I think the story I was told by Omega was that Kazuki Takahashi passed away. Right. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Got it. And then I procured them 10 months later through a source on Bai or something like that. Yeah. Unknown source, don't know, right? It just seems like he wants it to be from, like, some connection to Kazuki or Takahashi. Yeah. And it just sounds like spurious correlation or bias at best, right? Like, I'm just not seeing the connection here. And, and I definitely don't believe that these suddenly you know, appeared as a result of the passing of Kazuki Takahashi. There's just no way, right? Like, I would really need to see some evidence of that. Mm-hmm. And whether or not they, like, they would have that many copies just kind of sitting around and... And they're in such what, great shape, man, that too, honestly. Yeah. So that's, a, that's another thing. It's just like, if these were, like, on a sheet that's been, like, tossed around or similar to, like, the, the Wizards of the Coast, like, table where the people could just bring home, like, the employees could just bring home what they wanted, essentially. The scrap table, they they call it. Uh, where yeah, it just... that's, not a, that's not a thing in, in Yu-Gi-Oh. Right. I mean, I'm not aware of it. And, you know, like, even if, even if that's the legit provenance, like, if they were snuck out or something like that, there's no way you're going to get the provenance on it. It's right. just not going to happen. Right? Nobody's going to be like, too. yeah, I, if they were... I was given this by Konami. If right. they were if they were given out to by Konami, like chances are they're not gonna just not have a name on there. They're like they're, they're gonna give you a real copy of something that is gonna be you just don't know produced that you're gonna get or like it. You know, there, final copy. There are other ways thing. to do this, mm-hmm. um, and and that's the other thing I asked them for, which was the evidence. The evidence I was looking for is is print qualities and dot matrices and things like that. So I sent you some examples of Volume mm-hmm. One cards and Bandai cards and Breed and Battle. And um, breed, they're breed, breed and Battle DM1 era cards, right? So there are three different types of cards that predate or are approximately, uh, that appear approximately at the same time as um, um, these cards. And that's Bandai, right? Series one, two, and three. There's um, Breed and Battle and DM1 era um, Konami Yu-Gi-Oh cards. And then there are the Volume 1 cards. Right. And so volume one cards, uh, they have the dot matrix pattern. And then on top of the dot matrix pattern, the ink, the black ink is actually printed on top of the card. It is not dot matrix. Right. So there are two layers of printing that go on, maybe probably more, to be honest with you. But there are at least two, Mm -hmm. let's say. Right. And I believe that the uh, attribute the white part of the attribute is even printed on top of the, uh, the, the dot matrix as well. So the artwork is dot matrix, the um, text box is dot, dot matrix, but the text in the text box is not. Mm-hmm. It's solid black, right? One of the reasons that this would could be used as a benchmark is due to the timeline that, that they present, Drew and um, Omega, which I don't doubt, actually, because... They they have correlated the the this January twenty third release date January twenty third nineteen ninety nine release date of Magic and Wizards via um, old valuable books and and Jump magazines and things like that so that's probably real right they probably intended to release some version of Volume One ostensibly ma- the Magic Magic and Wizards version. Um, we don't know for sure, right? There's just an image of the Magic and Wizards Volume 1 box, and I think it says January 23rd, 1999, right? So ostensibly, they would have released Magic and Wizards volume version of Volume 1 in, in January of 1999. Now, if you know, right, Volume 1 was actually released February 4th or something like that, 1999. So, like, really close together. We're talking a week, man. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. there, that's not a lot of time no. difference. Right. So like it doesn't seem like that would be enough time to change your printing technique. Right. 
if you needed to change from Magic and Wizards to Volume 1 that fast, right, you only get one week difference between when you were going to originally release them and when you're actually going to release them. And the only difference is that you're changing the licensing data on the cards. It's not a huge burden to make that change, right, on all the cards, right, and then just print them on the sheets, right, whatever. You could even create, you know, they, we could even assume they had some buffer time to eat into, right, or whatever. And and so, but it, it's not really, like, uh, it would be a tall order to change your printing process, right? To change your mm -hmm. qualitative standards for acceptance on printing. That's what we're talking about, right? So if, if you assume that that is true, right, because I'm making an assumption here, a few, uh, if you assume that that's true, then the, the difference between what would have been released production runs is what we're calling them <laughs> if, we, if we assume that's true, your production runs would match the dot matrix printing quality of volume one now the surface might not be glossy right that's okay mm -hmm. right surfaces, is that a different step i assume surfaces are yeah. a little more malleable than let's say like the, the qualitative standards by which you would make the cards mm -hmm. so we would want to see on production runs on cards that were rounded, that we're calling cards that were intended for distribution, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I assume they mean by production run on their labels. Um, those cards should match the double layer printing on volume one. Card. So you should see the dot matrix in a very clean black ink pattern mm -hmm. that shouldn't spill or anything like that. And again, like it would be nice if the glossy pattern mat matched, right? We would want or hope to see that as well. If it doesn't match, it doesn't help them. And it, it detracts a bit from their ability to claim this is an authentic copy because, right? Because you can't say it's yeah. authentic because it doesn't match volume one. Like that's not a logical statement. That's, yeah, right? it's not, a, not a great time. Uh... That's, not, that's not a thing. But, you know, so I can't say it's it's fake because it doesn't match volume one, but it becomes more problematic to authenticate them if you say it won't match volume one. Okay, so now I don't have a benchmark. How do I know they're real? Well, even Bandai cards are double layer. Even even the Breed and Battle. Okay. And yeah. and Dual Monsters One cards are double layer. The blue ink for the names are printed on top of the gray and black dot matrix, and they have white dots in them as well. And that's one of the ways that we determine whether or not Breed and Battle and DM1 cards are real, because it's very difficult to, to mimic the, the layering that they do on those cards. I sent you some examples of that stuff as well. Um, you know, when you look at the blue name on like the Hitatsumi Giant or Blue Eyes White Dragon or whatever, there should be blue dots inside of them. Mm -hmm. and, and that's difficult to emulate, right? I assume that's a counterfeiting measure, but I'm not sure, right? No matter what, like that is a metric by which we measure authenticity for those cards as well. And Bandai included, right? Bandai also uses double layer with very clear distinction between what is and what isn't printed on top. So, you know, that in and of itself needs, needs to be a factor in our assessment on whether or not authenticity is real. And I'm not really clear on whether or not that metric was used um, as intended, right? I, I know that they considered the print qualities because they've discussed them. I, I don't know exactly what they did because I haven't seen it and I would need to do the assessment myself. So it doesn't, ultimately, it doesn't truly matter what, they've got unless they can show me clearly like this is an image mm -hmm. right of the card and this is or isn't right you know it does or doesn't match right it either does or doesn't and if it doesn't match that doesn't mean it's fake it just means that it becomes harder for us to authenticate right is that for fair sure. yeah 100 percent fair i know pokemon has the same thing and the vast majority of counterfeits like yes you can look at the rosette pattern and easily tell but also the, 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 the black layer on all the text and, and borders and stuff like that is like a separate very right. bold rather than being dotted well, and there'll be artifacts if someone tries to clone it or try and someone tries to like you know print print their own copies there's always going to be some sort of little ways to tell but that's not in something order. that's like prototype and, and then you're off in, in somewhere else I mean I mean you can still look for signs that it differs from what's actually been printed, but 
yeah, I mean, ultimately, again, it doesn't prove it's fake. It just proves that it, it's that we can't benchmark that way. And that makes it mm-hmm. hard to claim that it's authentic, right? It, and so when somebody comes to me and says, look at this cool thing I bought, and I'm like, you know, we'll never know if they're real or not, brother. Like, you know, it's a problem card. It's a high risk investment and, and it needs yeah. to be treated that way. Uh, you know, so when people are looking to to buy one, I always say you need to be very careful and spend money that you don't care if you get back ever. Mm-hmm. So if you blow 10 grand on a card, like, you know, you put it on the table at the casino, right? That's, that's high, that's high risk equipment. for sure. Yeah. yeah, it's high risk. Right? So the timeline, I talked about the timeline. We talked about, um, uh, oh, so I have a list of things that I wanted to talk about. Sure. We'll get, we'll get in that each and each and every one, if you'd like to. Yeah. So I, I won't, I'll be brief on some of these things because it's not really a, t- a ton of, there's not really a ton to talk about. So like I wrote test prints versus production prints. There are, um, there's no smoking gun to prove that there were ever production runs or test print runs of these ever made. We know that the images were created for them and that images exist in magazines and stuff like that. But I, you know, and this is going to be a little dense maybe for the audience, but um, in Yu-Gi-Oh! There are logo assessment, right? Because like Yu-Gi-Oh!'s or Konami's logo has changed over the last 20 somewhat years, right? Mm -hmm. Pokemon really has not, I assume, but I don't really know. But, you know, Konami used to have the square logo. I don't know if you ever played like SNES games and, you know, the Konami logo comes in together, right? It's the square logo and all that. Um, and those were printed on the old U.S. blisters and packs and stuff like that. If you know your stuff, that logo went away after um, Labyrinth of Nightmare Legacy of Darkness had this red banner um, in place of the square logo. But Legacy of Darkness and Pharaonic Guardian never had the square logo. But there are images of um, stock images of um, blisters of Legacy of Darkness and Pharaonic Guardian with the square logo. Do I believe that production runs were made and test prints were made of, of those blisters? No, never. Mm. <laughs> they don't so, exist. We've never re- seen them. Yeah. So when referring to like the Pokemon stuff and, and funny enough, Rusty, uh, he has some like makeshift blisters or like booster packs that are essentially yeah. sets that were coming out, but they're not necessarily something that was produced yet. So they just have like the foil as a makeshift I don't know if the cards inside or even the sets that were coming out. They could be just older cards. Uh, I think they were actually yeah. wrapped around other booster packs to the point that it did, they just wanted to have a display at an event or something like that. Yeah, it was a, so it was it was, a prop. Yeah, it was a prop. Right. So it could be something yeah, similar so to like, maybe we got we to gotta do something up real quick to make it look like that, and then they got the wrong logo on there. It's there's possible. a lot of planning that goes on with this, right? Mm-hmm. They make images because they want people to see it. I mean, that's obvious. I mean, everybody does that, even today. You know, so images were made and it was in magazines and stuff like that. And in the magazines, you see that there are they, they conflate the the um, the the different versions of these cards. Right. So a magic and wizard style dark magician is next to like three or four other non magic and wizard style cards. Right. Does that mean that a magic and wizards dark magician was made? There's, it's not proof. I mean, mm-hmm. it could have been made, but it's not an image of the actual card. Mm-hmm. That's the problem, right? There's an image of a Volume 1 Magic and Wizards box. Was it ever made? I've never seen one. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, And if I did, like, that still doesn't mean that that has to be real. Yeah, right? Pro- promotion material can be, can be faked or bluffed or I mean, whatever. P.T. Barnum yeah. used to say a sucker's born every day, right? Mm-hmm. You know, like you have to be careful because <laughs> just because it's in a magazine doesn't mean it's real, right? Mm-hmm. It means that they considered it. And so there is some information to glean from this. There is some, there are some conclusions we could make about these images, right? That, like, okay, so this was a concept that was licensed. There were probably production runs made. There were probably samples created. Were they ever distributed? Were they ever released? No, I don't mm-hmm. know that, right? Like, I can't say for sure that there were, but it seems legit that there probably were some made because, you know, why just make an image of it when you can print a couple copies of it or whatever, especially if you're getting so close, you're including it in magazines and things like that. So again, like, I'm not saying this is conclusive evidence that it's not real, 
I'm just saying again, like it's not a smoking gun. Mm-hmm. It's not in incon- in incon- like in- or um like uh, irrefutable proof, right? It's not irrefutable proof that these were actually made, right? And I haven't seen evidence that right that there's a legit in hand in a magazine. I made this right, or you know, Kazuki Takahashi saying, "Oh yes, a Blue Eyes was made for Magic and Wizards because it's my favorite card." So one of the things that um, Omega said was that, you know, because I said, okay, got it. So there were some real copies. Let's just assume that, you know, there are some real copies out there. Let's talk about the Blue Eyes. Why does the Blue Eyes exist? Because Blue Eyes is not a volume one card. Mm -hmm. So if we were making a volume one set, it's not in there. Especially if we were making it for release, right? Like, why would you change the set? you know, before release, if you're going to change the licensing data. I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying, again, like it creates a problem with the timeline that we've got as a result of all the evidence that we've um, amassed, you know. So if the if if all if there are some that were real and they were supposed to be volume one and that's what the production runs should look like, why does Blue Eyes exist? Blue Eyes is not a volume card. It's a starter box card. It came out like a month or or, or at least three weeks later, I think it's March, um, that starter box comes out with the movie. So why does Blue Eyes exist? And Omega's comment was, well, you know, Kazuki Takahashi says that it's his favorite card. And I said, well, where does he say that? You know what I mean? Like, where does he say, like, Magic and Wizards Blue Eyes? That's what I'm assuming he's talking Mm -hmm. about. Kazuki Takahashi made an admittance about Magic and Wizards cards. Well, I read the interview, and he says, Blue Eyes has special significance to me. Well, of course it does. Yeah, I mean, the, it's, the uh, it's isn't it just it's the it's the it's the Charizard. It's the, the whole it's the main thing. thing. Right? You watch the first episode of Yu Gi Oh, and you know that Blue Eyes is like the big deal because it gets ripped up and like, war yeah. and everything. Could they have made a Magic and Wizards Blue Eyes? I'm not saying they mm-hmm. they didn't. I'm just saying again, I don't have a smoking gun, right? And Kazuki Takahashi's admittance that he likes his Blue Eyes White Dragon because it's significant to him is not proof that the Blue Eyes would have absolutely have been made, and more so that the one that he sent in is real, right? Like again, there there are layers and orders of magnitude of difference here, and like mm-hmm. how will we apply the research that we've done? Like again, the research is good. Yep, Blue Eyes is a significant card. Okay, if they made prototypes, it seems legit that they would have made blue eyes as at least, you know, a stock photo. And if they ever made any prints, they would probably make a blue eyes, too. But, you know, again, like even though that that is the case, let's even though we're assuming that's the case. Right. And that's to it. We're assuming a lot here. That doesn't mean that the one that he sent is free either. And that all of them were square cut and had no name and no hollow. Right. Yeah, there's uh I got the screen up here now with that uh the the crepe seller and just like oh, just an insane amount of like magic and wizard stuff. So like So we can talk about it a little bit. Um and I'll I'll bring up Shinsuke and all that. So like I don't I don't claim to know a lot about Shinsuke. I didn't I didn't hear the name until recently. What I did know is that sometime a long time ago, a lot of fakes were made. Um not just magic and wizards, but also, mm-hmm. J1, J2, J3 band high cards, um, tournament prizes, and other things like Magic and Wizards. Um, for And a lot of the tournament prizes and things like that were made with the Magic and Wizards back. And, and all of those cards were all square cut and had no name. Okay, all so we, we got this bad boy here that I heard was... Uh, yes, that is, from... that, is, that is not a real card. Mm-hmm. Guar- guaranteed, right? There, there are some very glaring errors with that card, not the least of which is that at the time, it would have been impossible for, for that card to appear in Magic and Wizards because DM Dark Magician Girl wasn't even a twinkle in, in, in the OCG's eyes, right? Like, it wasn't even a thing. Like, that's a 2,000 card. Like, that's a year and a half down the line. And it's a prize card, right? So one of the big mm-hmm. ways, reasons to fake it is money, right? And I've done dot matrix assessments text alignment assessments right like all of that and those cards are undoubtedly fakes and they're not saying that they're not fakes they're saying they are fakes but the problem is is that they're saying oh our cards are different they're not those cards well these cards 
are are lumped into all of the other cards that are like you showed right on by mm -hmm. me, right they are brothers and sisters in the same problem set right they all appeared as a result of shinsuke or something like that and and at the time the market was inundated with these forgeries and this is old news i mean these have been around for like at least 2015 and 2016 at least okay. you're talking 10 years so i mean this is old old news um, and the same people that so, were behind this could have improved their process if, if we're being real here like there are similarities to what the the new stuff that we're looking at now it could be like, related it could be unrelated yeah the problem again is just that the market is flooded with fakes and so our standards have to improve as a result right because we can't mm -hmm. just assume that all of these cards are real and one of the biggest problems with these things is that it's easy to not make it foil. It's easy to not add the name. It makes it easier if you don't have to do any of that stuff, right? Like, because that's the hard stuff to do, to get the foiling right, to get the foiling on the name right, right? To get the font on the name right, to get the engraving right, the hot stamping, the layered hot stamping, the foiling under the sheet to get the cut, right? Like, all of that stuff has to, like, work you need professional printing machines and all that stuff yeah. and it's a lot easier to make them like this and so if you see a no name square cut right this one's not square cut those corners are hand rounded i can guarantee you right they would mm -hmm. not have like those are not natural natural Yu-Gi-Oh corners Yu-Gi-Oh corners are much different than that actually it looks like they use scissors for some of them like the bottom right corner kind of it kind of looks like they took scissors to it at some point and you see this with a lot of cards that are hand cut or like, you know, machine cut off of sheets or if that they even use like the paper cutters, um, you know, just because the lines are straight doesn't mean that it's not hand cut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so. a lot of that in like trimming stuff, more more so in sports and, and whatnot because of uh, because of the fact that they are square. So it's a lot easier to fake the corners and, and with the inconsistency and in like older sports stuff in terms of size a lot easier for them to get away with with that stuff there's just a lot of problems with this right and, and on, on and on the buy listing there are many 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 cards on that listing that would never ever appear as magic and wizards cards the asian english dark magician the asian english blue eyes the lob art blue eyes and dark magicians that came from starter box ex right those are in there too serpent knight dragon tokyo dome cards you know, like trap hole and dark hole and all this crap. Like th these are like, this is too fantastic, man. Like it's, it's just not possible, dude. Like yeah. the preponderance of evidence is, is right there in front of you. There are tons of fakes in the market. You need to be careful what you buy because mm -hmm. buying these, right? Like, Hey, I can get a blue eyes copy right now. I get it off of eBay or off of buy. You know, like there are plenty of copies because all he's going to do is go back and make more. <laughs> Or, I mean, like, or even if he's he could have more like with the the amount of listings that are here it could be that he doesn't want to list like 10 blue eyes at once kind of thing un, maybe he has thing. maybe he has 200 of these maybe there's a thousand of these that he's just going to slowly trickle in and and then if that's the thing too if well, like CG, if cgc authenticates it <laughs> even in the least bit irresponsible way then that's going to like trigger people into you know thinking like oh I can just go buy one I'll send it into CGC and then it's real, it's Pro confirmed real. So. And test prints are not common, right? I mean by definition. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying this is a prototype, this is a test print. If I can go and buy you know twenty on them of them on a lot, like I don't know if they're really prototypes or test prints, man, because like usually they get thrown away and they're not leaked into circulation, and if they are, it's sparingly. Like, right. for example, four position only Pokemon cards. Mm -hmm. How many of those? Well, you can count most of them on yeah. two hands, you know, and there's a reason for that. So it would be the same thing, right? These should be exceptionally rare by any measure, right? If, if they're really what we're saying they are. So I, I find it, you know, extremely problematic and, and you know, that we're saying, oh, uh, you know, this square cut, no hollow, no name, blue eyes has passed muster. I want to see the evidence, you know, like mm -hmm. if I'm supposed to be some sort of expert on this, like where's the evidence, man? Like I need to see a lot of stuff to be able to come up and say, yes, this five figure card is, is safe. You know, I just, 
I get nervous about that, honestly. And I want to tell people like, hey, like these are safe to collect or I want this to be real, honest to God, right? Like I'm not here to shit on mm -hmm. Drew and Omega or anything like that. Like I want to be able to go to PSA and say, yes, you know, we can slab these cards. These are fantastic prototypes. This is evidence. This is, you know, we have a rich history and it's great to be able to say all this. You know, I want to be able to say that, but I just can't. I can't honestly, genuinely, as a professional and steward of my hobby, go to PSA and say, yeah, these are real. Look at all this shit on Baye, too. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, the, yeah, the, the amount, bad, of, the amount awesome. of stuff there is a little bit alarming. And the condition that it's in, especially for, like, square cut stuff, where... And like it, it, I don't know how to explain it, but like it's just impossible for some of those cards to be real. Like not I would bet every the, dollar in my bank account. Not to mention the fact that like I would go I to know. court and and say this is this is one one hundred percent fake. Like show me the front of that card real quick, and I'll tell you if it's the if it's the yeah this this is a two thousand one card mm -hmm. one 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 of what right like there were one thousand copies given out of this card, the real one. I have one, right? It's on my Instagram, actually. There, there were 1,000 copies given out of that and 1,000 copies given out of Blue Eyes in the Shonen Jump lottery via the magazine in 2001. Mm -hmm. There's one, it is 100% fake. 100. I would go to court to defend that. 100%. It's impossible. There's no way that they would have conceived of making an English version of this card at that time like that. There's no way. It's not even possible. Not even remotely. Right? People will say Bandai made it at English Blue Eyes. Yes, there was one card made. But they didn't make this card in the OCG for two years. Like, it's yeah. just not even plausible. Like, it's laughable. It's just like they had the artwork, but they were, they were just sitting on the artwork and never used it until... Yeah, they just... Well, they just sat on the, on the language, right? On the release. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I just don't... I just don't see it, man. I, I don't see it. It, it's i'll come back and say like it's extremely unlikely like you got a better chance of winning the powerball yeah and then they just so, have like large yeah we talked about some other stuff yeah. like no hollow no name square cut like how can you how can you authenticate man like i would have to see a lot of more evidence before i could even say that and then i think we talked about bias like you mentioned this a little bit like that is that is a not a small concern of mine um i think i wrote it as like number six on my list but it's really like number seven or eight after i wrote a couple other things that we talked about like you know, <laughs> yeah i think um, just like the amount of bias that gets introduced when and like any of the opinions are like whether it's the research or whether it's the story coming from even if it was the story from the seller even if the seller didn't put on there that you can't ask questions about where they came from uh and they were answering questions of where they came from you still can't just like take that and just, you know, that's the end of it. That's what we're going to, that's what we're going with. Cause it helps our story. Uh, they're selling these cards to somebody who's selling these cards. You know, someone's authenticating yep. these cards. So clean, like, right? yeah, they just, Oh yeah, I have them. They're all perfectly perfect condition, you know, all production cuts. I think all those corners are rounded too, you know? So you know, clearly we're able to fake rounded corners in Yu-Gi-Oh. It's not a tall order these days. You know, a long time ago it might have been, you yeah, know, a counterfeiting all... technique, but but these days getting a these corner cut square. like oh, they're all square. Yeah. I think they had some some rounded corners in there too. You oh, know? Some of the listings. So, anyways, my concern with bias is with Omega and Drew, right? And and it's not like um I don't think it's deliberate, right? Like I don't want to say like they are intentionally going out of their way, right? Knowing that these are fake right? to go to CGC and get these graded. I'm not making that claim. No, I don't I'm, think what so the either. The claim I'm making is that they have a financial interest in this. They've got a lot of sunk costs. And so does some other people. Rusty, right? Bought that card probably for no small amount, I assume. You know, so I don't know how, how deep they're in on this, you know? And so I, there are multiple facets the factors of bias in here other than just the value too right so these guys are owners claiming that they're real they have a financial interest in them being real that's a real problem i think you know and i i'm hesitant 
to just accept anything that they present, you know, other than like literature, right? Legit primary sources. Um, I'm hesitant to accept more than other things other than that. Just, yeah, that's, that's the A Asian English blue eyes that would have been released in 2001 with the dark magician. I'm hesitant to accept anything they have to say just because I know that they have a financial interest in this. I mean, you know, it's already on eBay. So, you know, I'm concerned that they, that, that they're, they're marketing or hyping their own product and, and that they're the source that CGC used to authenticate these products, right? So that CGC took all the information that they gave them and said, mm -hmm. yes, this is enough for us. And, you know, I don't know what CGC received and what's, what CGC's process was for this. I assume that they did their due diligence here. But, you know, again, like if all of the sources that CGC had came from Omega and Drew, that's a problem for me. Mm -hmm an academic perspective, right? Like purely academic, you know, like if, if your only evidence is, is the guy with the interest in it being real, like that's a, that's not a, a thing, man. Like you need more than that. So I question how much um, bias is actually in here from a financial perspective. But the other thing is that they believe that this was some news that they were producing some novelty conversations here. And, and I don't want to diminish the importance of of something like that, like discovery, right? Yeah. That they came out and said, well, this is the first time that anyone's ever, right? Or that this, this is a new thing that we're introducing. We did all this new research and things like that. Most of this research existed for a long time. There are YouTubes on it, like from 2018, about Magic and Wizards cards and licensing things and things like that. And so I don't necessarily, like I'm not trying to diminish the work that they did, I'm just saying that when they came to market with these cards, they did so with an air of novelty, right? They are producing something new. Hey, look at this, right? So it's embarrassing to be told like, hey, we've known about these cards for decades, right? There's, there's real bias there because they need this to be exactly how they described it because they didn't consult any of us on this. Mm -hmm. I wasn't consulted on. And that's fine, right? Like, I don't need to be consulted on everything that happens in Yu-Gi-Oh! But I'm not seeing any, any experts in Yu-Gi-Oh! being consulted on this. And I'm not saying that they can't go forth and do the same work that I can do or that other people can do, but you would think that they would want some peer review before they produce something so explosively rare and novel so that they could say, yeah, we not only did the research, we talked to people who are leaders in the community who should know about this Japanese experts and things like that. Like who they talked to about this, that wasn't CGC or the owner or the buyer or something like that. Yeah. It's and again, like, I'm not saying the only people who they could talk to are people that would talk to me or that I know. I'm just not aware of anybody. But that's the thing too, is, is like, if they, if they were worried about competition, then that's not really a thing either. Because like the, as you can see here, there's, there's still copies there. It's not like it's, it's sold out or anything. No, like you that. can get copies of whatever they're selling. Mm -hmm. Clearly. I, and that's my personal opinion, right? Like, yeah. again, like, I don't know if their card is real or not. And if their card is real, then, the, then they can't get the copy. But what I'm saying is it seems like I can just go and buy a copy and send it to CGC. What's stopping me? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I'll just submit the paperwork that they submitted. I mean, I don't know, you know, like, again, I don't know what was submitted or what evidence mm -hmm. exists, but you know, when this was presented, it was presented like it was news and it wasn't, we knew about all this stuff. And the reason that these cards aren't on the front of a newspaper in the Yu-Gi-Oh community is because we know they're problematic, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going around and telling people to invest in these things. Like, Oh, I really want to buy like the first blue eyes ever made. Right. That's not even these cards, right? These aren't even the first cards Konami ever made. Konami made breed and battle in July, 1998, man. Like, Konami's been in the Yu-Gi-Oh! printing game for a year by the time these were planned to be distributed, or six months, at least, mm -hmm. right? So, like, the idea that these predate anything also doesn't really pan out, right? Like, it, it's just not a thing. Like, in the first Yu-Gi-Oh!-sized Yu-Gi-Oh! cards were Bandai. And the first Yu-Gi-Oh!-sized Konami cards are is volume one that's the first legit distributed product mm -hmm. that, that is acknowledged right again like we acknowledge that some of these were probably made but like to what end we can't like it's it's 
all of them are problematic, even the real ones. Yeah. So I just don't know, like, how you get around that. Like, I just don't, like, all of these problems are real. Like, these are, like, I came here to just present the facts, right? I'm not here to say the card's fake. It's my opinion that Rusty's Blue Eyes is fake. My personal opinion. My professional, what I can prove, what I can go professionally forward and say, I can't prove conclusively That's that any of their cards are fake. Because I don't have them in hand. And mm -hmm. I have no benchmark. And I don't know what they submitted. And I haven't seen any like mm -hmm. images of the cards. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what CGC says. Uh, I'm not going to make you comment on it. But I, I will add that like CGC has been very lax in terms of doing research on top of what is told to them or what is shown to them. We got a prime example of the Charizard that was laminated and the lamination was pulled off and it pulled off I, a bunch I of I heard ink. a lot about CGC drugs. They called it, called it an obstruction error. So I feel like it's just like, I get it. They want to like find their niche in the market and they want to be the error people because anytime anyone has anything that remotely resembles an error, they're advised to send it to CGC because CGC is going to be the most likely to grade it. Whether that's to their detriment at some time, in some cases, I, I would argue yes. But like this example here, all you had to do was ask the person that sold the card to the person that submitted it. And you would know that there was laminate, lamination on this thing. It pulled the ink off. Like that's as, that's as much research as was like required for that. And the person was you very know, willing to talk to me. Right, dude. Right. People are yeah, willing to have so. the conversation, man. Like it's free 99, man. I answer mm -hmm. my DMs. All of them. Like almost, I'll say almost all. I'm sure someone will say, I sent him a message one time. He never answered me. You know, like I'm a busy guy, man. Like I do all kinds of shit. I write for you. you know, I have a day job. Like I, mm -hmm. you know, I have go to school. I have a, a wife and a family, man. Like, you know, I, I still find time to answer my DMs, man. And I'm more than willing to have a conversation with Drew and even Omega, whose conversation with me was somewhat unprofessional, but that's fine. Right. No problem. You know, um, but, you know, I'm willing to have the conversation. I know everybody, all the guys that I would talk to were willing to have the conversation. I suspect the problem is that they didn't want to talk to people because they didn't want to fucking hear it. Right. I suspect. Now, I don't know that for sure. But again, like the value of peer assessment, peer review in this process should not be underestimated. Like, I'm not here to, to fucking glory hog, man, like to say, I figured this out. Look at me, like, and steal his work and all that shit. I'd be happy to put him in touch with a PSA SMR guy and say, this is a guy who discovered this. If we could prove it, right. Let's just say, right. And say, mm -hmm. Hey, interview him, like put this in your magazine, slab it, grade it. It'll be fantastic. Right. Yeah. But like, I have to get there. Like I have to have the conversation with them and things like that. But like, again, you know, I just don't know that they want to be told that this yeah, is a problem. Well, I mean, yeah, he's got two in his hand here, so I mean, they they clearly sunk a ton of money into this stuff. So that's Look, I'll at least three you, man, copies like, of this. PGC reached out to me about these cards, man, and truthfully, truthfully, honestly, mm -hmm. as a steward of my hobby, I am I regret not answering that email. I do. I feel bad that I did answer that email, but I'm on retainer, right? Yeah, my time is competitive. If I answer CGC's emails for free, right? Why the fuck would PSA pay me? Yeah. Right. Like this As is a bottom line there. function, yeah. right? Like I, the work that would need to go in into a no shit how to authenticate these cards and shit like this, like it is tremendous. Mm -hmm. The amount of work that would need to, we would have to have copies, we would have to have sheets, we would have to have conversations and dot matrix images and things like that. Like it would take me hours, tens tens of hours, yeah. hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars of work, right? Because I value my time. Right. You know, and then like I'm on retainer with the competitor, you know, like I, I professionally, I, I don't regret not answering that email, but like personally, I wanted to answer the email and I regret not rendering an opinion on this. But, you know, and again, like I like to think that they reached out to me for a reason. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I mean, that they yeah, said, they hey, be. you know, like, let's ask somebody who probably has an, an informed opinion on this. I mean, and, you should probably get as many I informed did, opinions as possible if you, you know, if you're gonna go I had ahead to, and. I had to get informed real, real fucking quick, man. 
Mm -hmm. real quick on this because as soon as i got sent this shit and saw that tca bought this right and like i've seen i've met and talked to rusty mm -hmm. and he's a great guy and a good collector and things like that like you know i needed to get smart on this because the hype train is coming right yeah that's yeah. what i saw right the submissions to psa are going to be enormous because people are going to think there's some secret arbitrage here like where they could just buy these things on buy and list them on heritage auctions for a hundred thousand dollars and now mm -hmm. that's their big come up right like that's that's not that's not a thing mm -hmm. and like and so i like I, I just need to know right like i i or i want to know as a professional but dude i i regret yeah. that i, I don't regret not answering no i mostly don't I'm like i can see this getting like very out of control and like the worst case scenario being that like a ton of people get ripped off for you know if they're buying them for 10 grand is it 10 grand canadian what is that like 7500 american per card you know like and then you got from, guys like aoki and all these hype artists and yeah. shit like that like that come in and they buy all this stuff and it's not a problem to be a, i'm not like you know it's not a criminal mm -hmm. to be a hype artist and an influencer in these markets and things like that these you know positions exist for a reason you know and and, and you know they're not bad people but you know the damage that can be caused is huge mm -hmm. right and, and i i draw a similarity to to when psa was originally labeling reprinted Yu-Gi-Oh cards like LOB reprints from 2010 and beyond as 2002 cards. And I had to have many frank conversations with people and say, this card is from 2017, man. You bought a 2017 PSA 10 blue eyes for $2,000, man. And you can get a copy for $25 tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that sucks, man. That yeah. sucks, right? Especially when it's your job to make sure that, you know, PSA is informed and aware. So that they can, you know, be a part of the market that your hobby generates and improve it or whatever and create value and whatnot, right? That's why PSA exists, right? They create value as a firm, mm -hmm. right? And we want that value to be as, as, as high as possible so that people are making money, PSA included, right? Employees, CEOs, workers, graders, submitters, customers, buyers, right? Flippers and everything, right? It's predicated on that. Our candid, genuine honest assessment from a professional perspective on authenticity matters mm -hmm. yeah so the, this the cleanup that would be involved in this like if it goes south i hope like i hope that i don't the want real, it to go south i don't want it to go south but i'm just like i'm just like i can that. see in my head that just like this gets out cgc's grading these they're available people are just buying them left and right people that can't afford you know a card of that stature at least not to be ripped off or for to go to zero to be worth nothing and then like how cgc can't clean that up they can't like i don't know man if people haven't even sent it to them yet and then they take back like you know they take back the few that they did grade they're like oopsie doopsie we shouldn't have graded these or they stop grading them and then people have these raw copies and they weren't involved with CGC. So CGC doesn't feel responsible for it. And I don't know, like, man. I mean, there, are, there it's, it's, it's in the, in the biz, it's called the cascade of effects. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> there, like, there uh, are a lot of effects, right? I think more and, important and than ever is just to like figure out, make sure are these real? Are they not real? Look, and not all of the rest. cards that drew had are fake. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll say it. Right, like that left arm that he had, that that wide cut left arm with the foil and the name and all that, right? That's mm -hmm. probably real. You know why I think that? Because it's got a name and it's got a foil. Yeah. Right. There's more aspects hey, on that's it. That's hard. Like, to be think. harder. Yeah. Additionally, the condition is really bad. Right. The corners are silvered, like old Pokemon cards, silver volume mm -hmm. foil, silver, because the foiling process was consistent with the way that Pokemon was foiled at the time. Mm -hmm. And so the edges wore really easily. And of course you see the, the um, uncolored foil on the top and it's just silver, right? So it's silver it on the edges, right? That's an indicator of authenticity mm -hmm. because that's the way that actual volume cards wear, right? So there's a yeah. benchmarking assessment that I'm doing here when I say like, oh, that card looks real. Why? Because it shares similarities with other volume cards from the period. And we can do that with that card. We can't do that with the Magic Wizards card. Right. Well, we can. I just don't know if they match volume one or not. And they should, given the timeline. So. Yeah, and with with all of these ones that are coming up here, like corners, square cuts, like you do anything to that corner and it's not a corner anymore. Oh, <laughs> like, uh, 
Just yeah. I mean, like, condition isn't technically proof of anything, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's just it's just weird that everything is mint because if it was test print, if it was something back then, and they they weren't stored. Maybe it was popular, they were, man. They weren't maybe like he kept it in pristine condition because he knew it was going to. That's the all thing too. It's like the all the old Pokemon stuff wasn't necessarily taken care of. Old Yu Gi Oh stuff, I'm sure, it was the same way. And then like test print stuff, we've seen like it's, it's usually beat up. You put it in your pocket. You go home from work or something. Like, like there's more problems. There's not, there's not like that I can count on one hand, yeah, man. Yeah, like, it's it's definitely two it's, hands. It's fishy. It's it's all around fishy. At best, dubious. Yeah. So, I don't really have a whole lot else to contribute, man. We pretty much hit everything, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, like I want to say, like I respect the work that they did. And I yeah. want it to be real. I want the cards to be real. And I know that the like there are probably probably real cards out there, right? Mm -hmm. But again, like how do you tell the difference? If if we want to be judged as a and I put this in books and when I that's that's the CMYK blue eyes on the right, right? right? That and DMG G three eleven Dark Magician Girl very okay. Those were common the two. to find. Mm -hmm. So the one on the right is undoubtedly a counterfeit 100 percent, all mm -hmm. of them every one of them right and that's the thing too if i you don't my know train of thought because i <laughs> Cause saw that, that. <laughs> we got some slides here that i can i can go through if anything sparks anything of interest yeah yeah sure, we get the sure, CG, sure. CG, do you CG have post? an image of the dot matrix stuff that i sent you um i don't i don't think so okay i can send them to you another time yeah. or something like that but um or if you go to my Instagram, you can probably find it as well. Um, so those were the the signatures that ended up being fake. Again, we got like Mercari. You got to be careful with the Mercaris. I have no Yeti comments Japan's. on his Kazuki Takahashi autos being fake, man. I heard stories about it, but that's about it. Were they authenticated? Know. Big sad, man. Big sad. Yeah, that sucks. I know I when know, PSA know turns sucks. away stuff, they they turn it away deliberately, right? Like there is a real assessment that goes on and. Mm -hmm. Their authenticity is is no joke. Because again, like one of the big things that PSA has is an authenticity guarantee. That's a that's a big deal, right? If you buy mm -hmm. a fake Beckett card or a fake CGC card, are they legally obligated to refund you based on their fine print? Like, yeah. I don't know the answer to that. Probably question, not. But I know that PSA is. PSA is on the hook, and they honor that mm -hmm. usually. I mean, I, I don't know if they always do it, right? There are going to be people. I think it's like it's kind of like an insurance thing where, like, they probably don't want to, or they're going to try not to. Um, or air on the there side is a financial, not to, there, but yeah, money is at stake. Money right. is definitely at stake. The CGC stuff, yeah. I have seen them like with that Charizard. Uh, they did pay out the person that that graded it. I think just the the their cost, which was not very much. It might have been a few hundred bucks or something. Beckett like that. does but the like, same thing. I, I saw it, I it's just, it's probably just easier for them at that point. But then when it starts getting into like ten thousand dollars a pop and if it's like a whole bunch of them, is that something that they That's do? That's my biggest concern with this. And people, that people that don't grade them yet but, but but purchase them based on the fact that CGC was going to grade them is like a whole different realm of people getting screwed over potentially. So so let's talk about this card too real quick because yeah. this is another one of those cards that would never, right? I'll say probably never, 99%, I'm sure, would never appear as a Magic and Wizards card. This is a uh, starter box EX release, right? It was a volume, it was a, not a volume one. It was a uh, series one release, the original one. There was a reprint later on, uh, starter box EXR. Um, that was a series two card, but this was a originally a series one card. So it's not as problematic as like the Asian English stuff. But again, like this artwork is not the manga artwork. It's like a later rendition of this card that appeared in starter box EX. This would not be the way that blue eyes was printed. If Kazuki Takahashi found significance in the card, this would not be how it was printed mm -hmm. for sure. Guarantee you the first way they printed it was not that way. 100%. So that's the thing too. It's just like even one. even if there aren't that many issues with any particular card, if there's a bunch of cards that seemingly like it doesn't line up that they would be artworks or or featured in that way, then it kind of the seeing um like a like a protostoice version of like Shining Charizard from Neo Destiny, mm -hmm. you know, 
or like seeing um, Cosmos Hollow on base set cards and saying it was a prototype or something like that. Like there are big problems with claiming that. You need a big, like there's a big standard of, or a high standard or high bar for proof in, in a discussion like that, mm -hmm. right? You know, so to prove a proto stoic is real or whatever, like the story matters, like you said, mm -hmm. right? If the story would matter here, right? Yeah. Like why would they make this art? This is not as good of an art as the original art. None of them are hollow. Yeah, it's rough. And this actually was a foil in EXR, so like you know, the name would be in, imprinted on it, not like it would be hot stamped into it. Like the name is printed on it, like it's common. Anyways, um, a whole lot more time, but um, I think that you know, I I I'll I'll, I'll start on my training again. Like I really think that you know, these being real would be great. Mm -hmm. You know. Like, and there are some real ones, and I, I deeply wish that we find, like, as close to an authentic copy as, as humanly possible sometime soon. You know, like, the, the sheet that Drew had um, is better, right, than having these cards. Especially because, you know, the Hitatsumi giant that, was, that came from it um, was, was clearly hand-cut, right, from the sheet. Um, again, like, you know, even forgers make sheets. They right. have to, yeah. right? Like, got to cut the card somehow, right? They got to come from somewhere, right? So not all sheets are real, right? That That's a thing mm -hmm. we need to consider as well in our standard for proof, you know, but, you know, that's the, the closest thing that I've seen to it, an authentic copy that you can get. Um, but why would, like, if we, if I don't know if he claimed this or not, but, like, if if the difference, there was a difference between, you know, the production runs or the Blue Eyes test prints, and and those cards, like, if that's the closest thing to real that we have, then then why would that be? Then why would we expect them to be different and then claim that they're the same? Mm. If you scroll down, there are some dot matrix things. Yeah, I was going to I was gonna say that. I'm pretty sure I saw. So that's one there, right? That's artwork. So all of it's dot matrixed, mm -hmm. um, even the black on that, right? Because the artwork's always dot matrix. If you click on Dark Magician Girl, that's the English Dark Magician Girl. That is an authentic copy. It's a PSA 10 that I own. And you can clearly see that the attribute itself, the purple, the red, all of that is um, dot matrix. But the white is not. Mm -hmm. That white is solid. If you scroll down further, there should be oh, um, some more, like that one on the right. Mm -hmm. um, that one. Mm -hmm. That black, right? Again, like that's what I'm talking about. You can see the border is dot matrix. You can see the text box is dot matrix. But what's not dot matrix is the numbers. Those get printed later. Mm -hmm. right? and separate, that's important. Separate step. Yeah, 100%. And Same that's in volume one, one and yeah. Bandai and in DM one and in Breed and Battle, all of which come out before or about the same time, supposed ostensibly, right, as um, volume one Magic and Wizards was supposed to be released. There's one more that I'll show you. Um, and that's the blue eyes that I scanned. I think it's further down. I, I don't know where it is exactly, but um it's okay i should have had these open in tabs but sorry man <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's it to open up as much stuff but... as possible here but yeah you don't have to go through my whole there it is this one? um i think it's on the right there maybe yeah that's it if you if you go to the right on the tabs further see that right there the text box also the text is also not dot matrix. Mm -hmm. Again, big deal. Licensing data, attack defense, the, the black line above it, and the and the text box. Also, yeah. the if there's a, you know, like um, LOD, for example, like if if people know their Yu-Gi-Oh stuff, it's there's often like a registration error in LOD cards where like the first edition text and the um, the LOD and the number of the set ID the uh, card number and the attack and defense and stuff like that are raised, right? They're higher or lower than they're supposed to be. And that's because all of those are printed on after the dot matrixing and the layering is done on the first layer. And again, we want to see that on these mm -hmm. cards because Breed and Battle, DM1, Volume 1, and Bandai all have double layers. Same thing. So that's it. That's it. That's all. 
the Yu Gi Oh yeah. on the bank. Awesome. Well, I think the Dark Magician that I talked about is down there too. I love that card, but um, <laughs> anyways, yeah, that's pretty much it, man. Yeah, that one right there. That's that's the scroll up on the right. That's the one that's limited to a thousand, right? Okay. That's the two thousand one. The one that that's fake. The fake one on Bai, right? It's supposed to be all. Supposed to have a name. Asian English two thousand one. Ninety nine percent chance, not real. Mm-hmm. Right again, dot matrixing, second layer, even in the OCG. Same deal. Well, thank you very much for uh, lending your your expertise and your opinion on this. I'm I'm definitely excited to see what's gonna come from this because it's it's interesting uh, uh, and hopefully like in the process like no one gets burned too badly or you know it's reduced or. If it Before needs to we be. leave, man, I just want to say, like, I respect the work that they did, man. I mm-hmm. was pleasantly surprised that the amount of work that they did was actually, like, you know, because people work all the time and get nothing for it, right? So, like, he right. said, I work really hard. I said, people work hard all the time, man. Like, that's not a thing. Like, that's not a metric of success. I need to see the work you did. And the work that they did was good. Yeah. It was good work, right? The only difference is that we're, we lack that last bit of evidence. Mm-hmm. We need more. We need more. Yeah, I, I want to know where it came from. Most that's my beef. Yeah. And I want to know where they came from too, right? Yeah. That's what we need. We need problems. All right. Thanks again for having me, man. Thanks, thanks really for fun. coming on. We'll have to uh, see yeah. see what happens with the uh, the CGC article. Hopefully it's not just uh, here's some scans of it and that's it. That's all. I, you know, if there I is really some kind of story be behind great. it, where it came from, I, I think that's just as important, if not more important, than uh, any amount of scans that you can do of the card itself. Uh, because clearly it was it was done with like professional equipment, but whether or not that equipment matches, whether or not the story matches, is is kind of what's what's missing here. I have not seen what they saw, yeah. So I don't. Mm-hmm. Know. Yeah. So hopefully it's good. Awesome. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. Hopefully this was educational and or entertaining. We made it this long. You're the best. Not as much jo- drama, maybe. Join the Discord. Less drama in this one, I guess, than than usual. No scammers. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. (laughs) Take care.